All right. I do believe we are live. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Break the Rules stream, BreakTheRules.tv on YouTube. We are also streaming this on Odyssey, on DLive, on Twitch, wherever you're going to uh, have to go to keep this thing going. Go there. Keep us growing because we're not relying on any one platform. And partly that is inspired by Sticks branching out. And I really appreciate the two people we have here, Sticks. Jonathan Peugeot, of course we got Giovanni Penichetti in the house, once again everybody subscribe and patreon.com slash break the rules and keep sharing this, the more you share this the more we can uh, grow and we really appreciate everybody here. So today we're talking about paganism, Christianity, kind of hearkening back to the old days of uh, the Roman Empire where there were various conversations of this sort, if we're talking about uh, people like uh, St. Ambrose and uh, St. Augustine. So well, let's just get started. I want to first uh, promote the heaven out of Jonathan Peugeot's new book that is coming out. This is a, a graphic novel. You could find it at godsdog.com. So before we get started, Jonathan, can you tell us a little bit about what God's Dog is? Yeah, well, God's dog is basically using the the Christian story as a mythological backdrop for telling a kind of epic token-like story. Um, and so that's the idea. It's like, I, I feel like in a way it's the t 50 years ago when Token wrote his book, the, people would have found it weird to do this. But I think that by now there's a lot of, enough people have understood that the, the Bible is really a mythological structure and that's fine. It does It's not a hostile to you if you think that. And so we take all the weird stuff from scripture, giants, dragons, and we basically put that as the backdrop for the story of the dog-headed saint, Christopher, that people don't know about. They don't know that uh, there's a dog-headed saint in, the, in Christianity. And so, so St. Christopher is basically like this wild dog-headed man who encounters these pilgrims. So St. George is in it, St. Simeon the Stylite, this guy who stands on a pole his whole life. Uh, so yeah, so it's just, a, it's just an epic story um, in that world. And people get a PDF for ten dollars. They get for fifteen dollars uh, something uh, something more over here. Thirty dollars. They get the actual graphic novel. So guys, please invest in this. It's been hitting uh, the mark incredibly as far as the amount of people that were going to uh, uh, to get this early on. So this is definitely a treasure. Take uh, get this and also invest in Jonathan Peugeot's absolutely beautiful icons. You also made Saint Christopher as an icon as well which is a very beautiful piece. So guys, get out there and of course, buy uh, Tarl's uh, Stix's uh, uh, Critical Race Theory book, selling like hotcakes mm. from what I heard. So uh, where could people get the, get that Stix? Yes, just look up uh, Critical Race Theory on Amazon and it's uh, actually on the front page at this time. By the way, RIP so nice. to uh, four th Yeah, it's like 4,000 copies at this point almost. Amazing, nice. as uh, Jesse nice. Lee Peterson would yeah. say. But by by the way, I really want I want to get the uh, Saint Christopher book that you wrote, Jonathan. Actually, yeah, I think it's right. Up your that house. sounds like, yeah, that, exactly. I was going to say that. <laughs> and uh, who is the uh, illustrator of the Saint Christopher book? By the way, his name is Court Nielsen. Um, he's he's someone who who was a graphic designer, but I he, I met him online and I saw how great his work was, and I thought I think he can do this. And yeah, he, he did a great job, and the color is awesome too. Philip Cartin, where. It's kind of like uh, if you know Hellboy or Bone, that's the kind of style we're going to, like a simplified style and kind of very simple uh, flat colors. Yeah, I, I'm really happy with what's what's happening with it. Excellent. So Was it, wasn't Hellboy yeah. the one with uh, Ron Perlman there? The <laughs> yeah, little yeah, 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 exactly. Little Donnie. Yeah. Yo, little Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> the most epic Hellboy. meme. <laughs> yeah, I especially yeah. love the uh, the cat version of uh, uh, that guy as well. So, uh, oh, in, you know, that furry, bushy cat. By the way, oh, that would be considered the first furry, by the way. Would St. Christopher be like the first furry in don't, terms don't, of... Okay, no, I'm not going to... No, 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 listen, no, no, no. listen. No, no, no. So, I, I've been like, I've been... St. Christopher has been really important to me for a very long time. So, in 2012, I wrote an article about it. Uh, and that article, like, if you write dog-headed St. Christopher in Google, it's one of the top articles that comes up. So I wrote that a long time ago. And then when I wrote it, there weren't that many images of him around. And then they just started seeping into the internet and people started knowing about it. And then, yeah, a few years ago, someone sent me a link of like on a furry uh, like panel or something where they had posted my article and they are calling for St. Christopher to be their patron. 
patron saint. Nice. <laughs> So, Patron Santa Fury. So I know um, that uh, so, oh I, I know that sticks. You started uh, out your life being a Christian. So you were raised in a Christian household, and then you went into uh, uh, Satanism, I believe, and now you are a pagan. Would that be a fair assessment? And uh, what brought you through the journey? And then I'm gonna ask Jonathan the same thing yeah. as far as what led him to uh, Christianity. That would be close. So I was I was raised a marginally Christian, like in the liberal Christian sense. So you, you have a Bible in the house. Sometimes you read it. You go to church on Christmas and Easter, basically. And then, you know, you do the Lord's Prayer at night. Um, became actually much more religiously Christian in the Protestant non-denominational sense when I was in, in my late teens. Uh, had abandoned that uh, contemporary to when I went to college. Some people think that's because I was indoctrinated, but it actually had more to do with witnessing fundamentalist Christians on the internet. Had nothing to do with my studies or anything. Um, became an, a, a Satanist uh, and, and then, well, technically a hardline, just atheist first. Then I discovered atheistic Satanism. Uh, I used that as a stepping stone, essentially to purge myself of false guilt and fear. And then I realized, well, you know, that's all that Satanism can ever offer anyone. What am I doing? And I decided to just study all spirituality. When I call myself a pagan, it's because I'm not part of the Abrahamic mainline religious tradition. It doesn't mean I have a specific denomination or church, and I'm an occultist. So I'm, I'm interested in studying every religion. I'm working on a book of mystic Christianity right now, another one on actually a Jewish fables from the Talmud, uh, <laughs> the religious history works from paganism. Uh, I, I don't really care. I just want to study as much as possible. Excellent. And how about yourself, Jonathan? Well, I mean, it's interesting because in a way, I think I have a similar story as Tarl. Like, my, I mean, I grew up in a more practicing family. Like my, my family, my father was a Baptist pastor. I didn't experience the crazy um, fundamentalism in my own family. My, my father was a, actually a very intelligent and curious person who encouraged uh, exploration and thought. But let's say around me in the culture, that's what the culture I was bathing in, let's say in terms of evangelical Christianity. And the same, like in my twenties, I just realized that this is not, this is not going to do, like, it's just not going to do <laughs> for many reasons. And so I started to study um, mystical traditions and to some extent, let's say what you could kind of call esotericism or, you know, late occultism. Um, but I also felt like that wasn't enough because I felt like it was, that there was something off about, about occultism, especially. And then when I discovered Christian mysticism itself and the early fathers, I just, I just realized that everything I'd been looking for was there already. And then I also discovered the art of the church, like these, the amazing iconography that the church had developed for about a th the first thousand years. And uh, it became my own art practice. So I, I'm an iconographer. And the, you know, the architecture, the liturgy, all of this kind of amazing dance, you could call it, like this, this great ritual dance that was there in the church. Um, so then I just became Orthodox because it seemed like it was the only branch of Christianity that had preserved this mystical aspect that not only preserved it, but that was central to the faith. Um, and that also preserved all the art and all the, this language that you could call it. So that's, that's what happened to me. And so I've been Orthodox since 2003 you now. And uh, I want to oh, go on Gio. Yeah. Oh, no, I had a question to start the convo, but if you want to go ahead, left. Well, the only question would be here as far as uh, Jonathan's path. You mentioned that you were interested in a lot of the uh, mystical occult elements, but eventually you found what you were seeking within those elements within Christianity. If you were to make a good uh, persuasive um, argument, let's say, uh, but in a friendly way, obviously, uh, to uh, Sticks, as far as what was it about the occult that, uh, you know, eventually got you away from that? And what was it within Christianity that brought you to that? Uh, so that maybe, who knows, maybe Sticks will be converted today. We'll, we'll see what happens. And the other <laughs> side would be what, what uh, Sticks found lacking in Christianity would be the other Exactly. Yeah. That, that, that'll be after. And everybody, by the way, subscribe and also sneed those super chats. We're going to read those at the end. Anyway, yeah. go for it, Jonathan. So I think that if we look at Western Christianity, we kind of see a change in the late Middle Ages happening. And we, you know, through nominalism and through different through different things, when the, the, the Reformation happens and the Counter-Reformation happens, it kind of crystallizes all of this. And so it seems like what we see is what I call a kind of deincarnation. And so you what you see is you see a kind of a Christianity that's at the bottom that is more is very basic, that becomes very literalistic and very um, moralistic as well. 
And then what happens is out of that comes these weird Christian esoteric branches. You know, if you look at uh, Freemasonry, but then, you know, the idea of the Rosy Cross and all of these, these organizations that pop out of Christianity and then start to want to have the more mystical aspect of it. But let's say divorce from the, the church or divorce from the ground, you could, you could say. And, um, and so I have sympathy for that. Like I have sympathy for people that wanted that because I don't want this meal toast uh, moralistic Christianity. I don't want that either. But I think the problem that happens is that at some point this separation becomes a hostility. And then that hostility becomes one of the sources for the breakdown of the West. That is, it, st it starts to manifest the, the fragmentation of our societies. And um, I think that one of the problems that happens with kind of esoteric uh, thinking in general is that it's, it's so high up that there's no room for the regular people to participate in it. And so you drop the regular people and then the regular people, they end up doing their thing and then you're not, that you're not part of their world and it breaks the world apart. And then it leads people, especially then it leads them into idiosyncrasies up here. And then you get all the weird stuff, you know, you get, uh, you get weird stuff like, uh, like uh, Sabbateanism and basically Satanism where the people that are super smart and are supposed to be the elite are basically acting for themselves or acting, actively acting to destroy the society. Like, I mean, not in the sense that they're taking, they're taking, they're, they're physically doing it, but let's say intellectually, they're breaking down the structure. And so I think that all of that has led to the, to the breakdown of our, of our world and has led down to the breakdown of society. And so what I see in orthodoxy is I see that you have room for these high mystics that live, you know, like, idea of the naked ascetics that live on the top of Mount Athos and are like invisible and naked and no one sees them. And then they can manifest themselves to the monks if they want to. And so there's this whole hierarchy of spiritual realization. But at the bottom of that is like my, you know, is your cousin, your aunt who doesn't know much, but they can still cross themselves and go to church and go to confession and take communion. And it's all integrated into a giant thing. So I think that to me, that makes uh, a lot more sense. And I think what, what unites it is Christ, is united is the notion of incarnation and how incarnation kind of joins the extremes together into, into one, one moment. And that becomes the, the fruit for, for the church and the fruit for, yeah. So that's why I think, I think it makes more sense, yeah. Well, that's a very good understanding of contextualizing Christianity within our own contemporary epoch of immense um, liquid modernity fragmentation. Uh, I know we're very lucky to have both of you. Uh, I know people have referred to you as part of the, uh, what do they say, four horsemen of meaning or whatever, <laughs> which I think is totally cringe because we have to leave the original four horsemen in the sands of uh, YouTube uh, atheists. Yeah, we gotta, uh, we, we gotta put those, we gotta put so. those horsemen to a pasture, if you will. I just, I wonder who would be of the four horsemen of meaning, who would be your PZ Myers, who is just seething that he's not up there with, uh, oh, I don't know. Maybe. I will we'll not see. name names. That would be, that would not be. Your yeah, name. that wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. K so, 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 uh, yeah. So sticks. Other coin, yes. Yeah. So sticks. Um, so Jonathan, as you outlined sort of this very uh, succinct, um, defense of Christianity in the modern world, but you as an occultist or a pagan, what, led you down to the questioning of the roots of Christianity and what do you find within I don't I, I don't know if you're a polytheist or anything like that but no no yeah but well well, well first of all what do you believe in terms of uh, a sort of yeah. spiritual source or so forth so maybe contextualize your belief I know it's very hard like I don't want to pin people down but what do you yeah mean that's that's occult? that's what that's what I would say is the occult the search for truth the search for what is hidden um, it doesn't posit necessarily proof of truth. Uh, what I've done, my, my metaphor for it is, with most mainline religions, you're trying to find the right path, and you go along that right path to your end goal. And by the way, to Jonathan, I don't begrudge you that because you feel that you've found you know, your particular path. It fulfills you. It gives you meaning and so forth. And I've pointed out several times in the past, when I was more linked to hardline atheism, I considered that, you know, maybe stupid. Now I'm like, well, as far as the pragmatic effect, it's not destabilizing anything. It's not harming anyone. It's the organized religious structure 
when it's abusive that I have a problem with. And that's partially my own civic views. What I would say, though, in my belief is that it's not trying to find one path, stick with it forever to the exclusion of others. It's more looking at all of the paths, wander down one for a while, switch to another one if you feel inclined to do so, research and learn as much as possible, think as much as possible. And what I've said is that the occult doesn't really work for uh, uh, most people. The, the occult, as I envision it, being that kind of strenuous search for truth is only going to work for a minority of human beings. And by the way, it has nothing to do with intelligence. It has more to do with interest and, and maybe, maybe stamina as far as that kind of subject material goes. So you have ignorant people following organized religion because they were born into it. They don't want to question it. You have intelligent people like Jonathan who have found a religion and they've decided to stick with it because they've, they've got that sort of importance that they give to it. They've looked into it. They feel fulfilled. I would also say that technically speaking, if you're following a more mystic version of Christianity, and this would be more <laughs> definitely closer to the Orthodox tradition or some of the others than like Catholicism or mainline Protestantism, um, technically speaking, that is occultism as far as I would personally describe it. If, if you are attaching mystic symbolic importance to the Christian tradition in your understanding, technically speaking, that doesn't make you separate from the occultists. Well, uh, if, 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 uh, if you define it as like, like the secret society side of the occult, like the Freemasons and Rosicrucians, maybe it's different from that. But again, those are organized groups, which is something that I myself have always shied away from. Mm. I'll study them. I'll listen to, I'll certainly read their books, but I'm not going to become like a Freemason or something. I don't even think they'd welcome me because I'm Thank technically God. an apatheist. Well, uh, Sticks, in terms of your uh, search for the truth, what would be the reasons why you wouldn't go uh, completely on uh, Jonathan's path as far as becoming, let's say, more of an uh, esoteric Christian or maybe uh, going up to Mount Athos, you know, joining a monastery, things of that nature? What would be the things that would make you hesitate about that if we're going more into the nitty gritty in terms of what the truth is? Yeah, be because I give the search and and... Uh, more importance than the end goal. It's like when you read a good book, the ending is, is sort of bittersweet. It's the adventure that leads up to the ending that really is where you're living. Um, life, you know, ends, it terminates biologically at the end of that life. It's all the things you've done up until then, all the searches and adventures that you've had that are notable, that someone would write about, the death is a little postscript. Uh, that's how I choose to live my life, looking through all these things. But I would say, I'd have no problem going up and talking to monks in a monastery. And if I looked into mystic Christianity after the Orthodox path, and I'm sure uh, I all encounter books on it at some point, considering my, my voracious reading, uh, I'd be very interested in studying and learning more about it and the symbology associated with it. It's just, I, I wouldn't, I'd go to a monastery, but I wouldn't consign myself to one and say, okay, for the indefinite future, when I might get bored, this might not be for me. I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to meditate upon God, et cetera. But Sticks, don't you say that that's maybe a life that is ungrounded in or in, uninstantiated within a particular tradition? And that's sort of like that Wayfair state, like as you've admitted, isn't for everyone. But yeah. also, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, I just said, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, Jonathan, <laughs> it's funny. Recently, um, my father was doing um, a driveway near this Orthodox church, and uh, he was talking to the head um, priest and his son, and uh, he, the, he handed me uh, this pamphlet and everything, and I don't know if it's a sign, but I don't think I could really give up Catholicism. I mean, it's as an Italian, it's genetic, you know. Uh, but I do, I do wish that we had a... that Pope, though. You'll see how long you'll. Last. We'll, well see. they say he's on his way out, health-wise. I don't know. Yeah. That's just a rumor. But um. Yeah, I mean, there there is supposed to be an anti-Pope at a certain point, well, according to uh, Revelation, right? Malachi, yeah. yeah, isn't there a yeah. prophecy of the popes? And yeah, it's the prophecy yeah, on that. No. It's allegedly, you're on the last one now. Or... Yeah, mm. yeah. But as far as. Um, uh, Oh, go on. But it's, yeah. No, I was going to say that I wish that uh, in Catholicism we had a word that the Orthodox have. Uh, pre, am I pronouncing right? Pre last? Per last? Pre -list. Pre -list. Yeah, pre -list, Yeah. Yeah, the Russian because accent over seems, here. It seems, that the, <laughs> it seems that the world has been caught up in um, 
various spiritual delusions within well the past hundred years, but I would say the last mm. two years especially. But, but um, so Sticks claimed that you uh, that orthodoxy is another form of occultism, which is very spicy. But so, the, oh, mystic, sorry, the, the mystic side, the mystic side oh, okay. of it, yeah. at least. Yeah. Um. So maybe Jonathan, you could just. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I cut you off, Lev. I'm sorry. Well, I would say so. Listening to what uh, Sticks is saying, I I understand. Like I understand the impetus, but I, but uh, I think that think about it like that the spiritual path is something like going up a mountain. That's a pretty simple vision that you have, you know, and you see that in many mystical traditions that the idea is that you're going up this mountain and that you're going higher up in the world. Like you're basically understanding more of it, participating in more of it. When you get to the top of the mountain, you're at the summit of the world and you basically you're above everything and you basically kind of, you can encapsulate the world in your, in your view, you know, um, the difficulty I think with this sim simply this exploratory path is that you don't end up going up the mountain. You end up hop skipping and jumping around the base of it, you know. And so and there's a there's a value in practice, right? Yeah, and there's a value in practice where practice is difficult. And if you want to practice something, there's let's say you you practice a certain form of meditation or a certain form of prayer or a certain form, it's actually difficult and it takes time and it takes a lot of energy to to do that. So what happens if I think if you skip and jump around the base of the mountain and you're like, oh well, here's a little Kabbalism, here's a little bit of of, of you know of like American uh, esotericism, theosophy, or whatever, all these things that 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 exist. The, I think the difficulty that happens is that you don't end up, you become a dilettante in a way. You become someone who knows a lot about things, but you don't necessarily have the deep practice that will lead you up the the mountain and you see that like uh i remember reading an, an art, uh, interview with joseph campbell and someone asked joseph campbell you know have you had some of these mystical experiences you talk about and he said he says no and he says no because i you know i just study religions basically i don't have access to them like he can't be initiated because he he does he's not on a on a path and so i think that that to me would be the difficult part like to think of it of it that way because there is an aspect of initiation in, in even in esoteric Christianity, there's a sense in which you kind of have to be initiated and that, and you have to have someone who basically brings you up, either, whether it's institutionally or just informally, that's at least that's how Christianity works. You, you're initiated. Christianity is an initiatory uh, religion. You receive, you, you know, you, you're baptized and then you're chrismated and those, and then you take communion. And so all of this, is like a movement into the mountain or movement mm. up the mountain, you could say. Well, so but, I think that that to me is maybe the most, well, at least like as an, idios at, at, as an idiosyncrasy, I can understand that, that, that he would, that Tarl, that you would do that. But I think that it definitely can't be a model. I don't know if you see what I'm saying. Like, it mm. can't be a model for, for society. Well, can there be I a I understand your point, yeah. but well here, I've, I've, I've got to weigh in on that though, but. Uh, what I would say is this, there are millions of mountains and the mountains have more than one path up them. And so what you've done is you've, you've found your path up one particular mountain. That's great. You get to the top of the mountain, you can see all the things around you. But if I climb to the top of Killington in the middle of the spine of the Green Mountains in Vermont, I can see New York, I can see the edge of New Hampshire, you can see almost down into Massachusetts, depending on the weather conditions, and I can almost see Canada, but I can't see Tibet. I can't see Mexico. I can't see the middle of the Pacific Ocean. What I stress is that there are an infinite number of paths. I don't believe in just one particular physical mortal existence. I believe in reincarnation. That goes into the realm of science more even than spirituality almost. Um, and so I, I, I don't personally feel compelled to do that. And also the idea of a society, yes, for, for a society, Maybe they need more rigor, and that rigor is ever-changing. One religion rises up, they get slaughtered, or they get converted, they slaughter and convert others, and this is the history of organized religion, another reason why I'm skeptical of <laughs> ever supporting one, although the orthodoxy is less uh, bloodthirsty than most of the other major organized religions that have existed, so congrats for that. What I would say, though, is that what works for a society doesn't necessarily work for an individual. If you're talking about an initiatory system in Christ, of course, Jesus deviates from the religious orthodoxy, not the Orthodox Church, but the orthodoxy of his own day. Uh, it isn't a Pharisee, he isn't following the Sadducee tradition. 
um, isn't following in, in large part, technically Roman law, you know, going into the temple and then, you know, whipping people because they're money lenders and they're basically a bunch of grifting shysters <laughs> and the bankers of the day um, didn't follow that path, was, was one of the individuals who became the, 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 the master as opposed to getting initiated by a master. And throughout time, we see this happening again and again. And by the way, I'm not declaring myself to be some sort of spiritual master, but I believe that if you want to become more knowledgeable, help others, etc., you don't have to follow that one path of the mountain or any other specific path. And I don't know whether you believe people on those other paths can make it to the top of your mountain or not, um, but they can find their way up. They don't necessarily need a bunch of signposts, or at least they don't necessarily need a guide. You can see the top of the mountain from the ground level. Well, then find your way up the mountain. And on the way, you'll see cool mushrooms and pine trees and maybe a deer and all of these other wonderful things. And I think some people, sometimes people are so fixated on this end goal that they can't see the forest for the trees. So then would you default to assertive perennialism then, I guess you would say? Some court, maybe not a good onion perennialism, but maybe the, the sentiment maybe is there. Are you, are you asking me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, then we'll get John. But. I, I, what I'm just saying is that I think that the main importance is not on where you end up. It's, it's how you get there and the experiences you have along the way. Those human experiences are meaningful. Yeah. I mean, I kind of, I kind of, I get it. I think, let's say, first of all, first of all, it's important to understand that, that Christ even though in the story of Christ, so we need to, to take it seriously in the story of Christ, he is the God man, like he is an incarnation. Uh, and that's the way Christians understood it, but he still is initiated because he, when he goes to see St. John the Baptist, uh, St. John doesn't want to initiate him, but he, Christ says, this has to happen. Like you have to, I have to actually participate in this pattern. You have to initiate me so that for basically for the sake of others, you could say. And so there is, I don't think there's a sense, the idea that Christ is like just a rebel, I think is, doesn't hold up in his story. There are some aspects of him where he's bucking uh, corruption and bucking the things that don't work, but he nonetheless, he also says that, you know, he tells the people that they have to, um, th that the Pharisees uh, are sitting in the seat of Moses and that they, they should follow the Pharisees because they basically are the ones that have received the tradition from Moses, but they just shouldn't do what they're doing because what they're doing is corrupt and, and evil. And so I, I, I think Christ actually does participate in the system, but there is, he understands also that there's a, an issue happening, that something is happening. I mean, he knows that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And so he, he talks about that in the, in, the, in the text. And so he knows that this system is going away. Like the, this system of sacrifice that's there in, in, in Judaism is, is going away. Like it's going to happen. And he's like, get ready for it. It's going to happen. And then what? And so he's in, he, he also does modify the tradition in a way that makes it more universal. It kind of opens up the, the Hebraic tradition for the, for, in a universal way and then modifies some of, the, some, of the, um, some of the rituals in order to kind of encompass everybody. You know, so to you know, remove, basically Christians remove circumcision, you know, they change it with baptism, all this kind of stuff. But it, it doesn't, I don't think Christianity sees itself as just a departure from what they receive, but rather as a kind of, especially in the Orthodox tradition, like a continuation, but a universalization of the, of the faith. And I think that's also important. It's also important to look at the particulars of the traditions and what they're doing. So like, we need to take that seriously. Let's say like a, tri those tribal, like a tribalistic shaman shamanistic tradition is not available to everybody. It just isn't. You know, it's local, it's idiosyncratic, it has a lot of layers, it, it's, it's difficult for, for many, many reasons, but there are some traditions that present themselves as having a wider possibility, as opening mm -hmm. up towards the world, right? You, you have Buddhism, well, you have Christianity, you have Islam, and these are objective, like they're not, uh, you, can't just, you can't just take Christianity and say, like, all these weird little sects that you see in your religions, it's all the same. It's not the same. Like there is an actual difference in the way that it mm. uh, that it presents itself. I think that's important to um, to understand. But wouldn't, and, but and, wouldn't those sects uh, spiraling off of the main older Christian branches? Wouldn't those roughly approximate that same tribalism? 
You mean like, yeah, especially in the, let's in say the, the Protestant yeah. breakdown, you could say mm -hmm. that's definitely yeah, no, something I mean, that's happening. Groups. Yeah, no, that's definitely something that's happening. But I think that most Christians see that as something of a, of a scandal, even though they disagree with each other, they know that mm. it shouldn't be that way. Like, it's not, it's not like, okay, it's all fine. There's a little bit of that in the weird non-denominational world where it's like all these different groups that aren't supposed mm. to be in with each mm. other. Like they just, but there is a sense, at least tradition in Christianity, there's a sense in which the, sh the schisms in the church are, we don't, we're not happy that they're there. Like mm. we wish we could mend them. Like we wish we could. But, uh, but uh, would you, but mm. would you believe, uh, just a sec, mm. Lev, if I may, yeah, sure. would you believe, for example, that other groups outside of Christianity, like, do, do you believe in the concept, for instance, someone is born and raised in the Inuit tradition or something, especially back before Christian contact? And they just so they don't follow Christianity. Uh, would you believe that they would suffer for that, or for you, is it more purgatorial, or is it like Jesus saved everyone through grace, or you know what what particular well, tradition would you follow on that? Well, I think well, that's that's more of a Dante yeah. thing. Well, so so it's, um, Saint Justin Martyr talks about the logos permaticos. This is like second century Christianity. He talks about the logos hidden in the world, that the divine logos is the animating principle of reality. And that it's it's hidden in all creation. That all things that are true are Christian. You know, he he even says, you know, like the old philosophers, uh, Socrates, Plato, they're basically Christians because they are in line with the divine logos. And so, so this is a, this. Not all Christians believe this, but this is a fully legitimate Christian position, which was pre, which was present right at the outset. And so I do think that what Christ does is reveal the way in which the world holds together, reveals the principle of reality, which is, which is like secretly self-sacrifice is maybe the best way to understand it. Like that self-sacrifice is the secret of how reality actually holds together, like physically, ontologically holds together. That's the secret. And so, but then that, that is there. Aspects of the divine logos are there in all traditions until then. And so I would say that that's the, that's the theoretical answer. And the practical answer is, I don't know. And to be honest, it's not my, it's not my problem. But do you, right? also I think that there's a speculative aspect to, to these types of questions, which are, which are not useful. It's like, it's someone it's like I'm living my life and I'm trying to, to move in the direction that's good and that's transformative. And that's freeing me from my, my idiosyncrasies and my passions. It's like the, asking myself whether someone 3000 years ago in the desert is going to heaven is the use the most useless thing that I could ask myself? What about because it's just distracting today? me from what I'm supposed to be doing? <clears throat> what about someone today in which the I mean, by and large, pretty much everyone in the world is exposed to various comparative religions? And no, I think the it's the same. Has, yeah, I think it's the same. I think that so it's, it's just you, a, you don't judge. Yeah, yeah, it's not for me to decide. I do believe that Christianity offers the offers the culmination of the stories. I do think the story of Christ is a culmination of stories. And I do think that, that Christianity offers uh, the key to the mystery that love self-sacrifice are the, are the way in which reality holds together. And I do think that the Trinitarian God, for example, is a revelation of how the world works. Um, but I don't think that it, just because you don't have, let's like, just because you don't have that means that you're going to hell or whatever you know mm. it's like but, but that's me too like i i never talk about the afterlife because i just find the a afterlife is an image of of mostly an image of now like that's most even in dante mm. that's pretty yeah. much what it is it's because yeah. yeah but uh jonathan do you think that there well, is like a the uh, Inuits were, were going to heaven so oh, that's that's nice of you geo do you think that there is a problem today which i believe a uh, rudolf steiner talked about this where you do have a lot of people in the modern age not being able to put all of their faith and trust in one particular religion just because there's all these other religions like uh, like um sticks mentioned and with that do you think that there may be more of a need more of a necessity to look deeper and figure out how can we actually logically versus just with blind faith be able to showcase to as many people as possible that Christianity, that the things that we believe that this is the true path, or try to give them some kind of version of it which is as close to uh, a kind of reality that they can then discover for themselves as possible as opposed to just saying we're the right ones, they're the wrong ones. 
The answer, it's complicated. The thing is that you can't, you can't make stuff up. Like take, let's take Rudolf Steiner. That that's a good example. It's like you can be un, dis, dissatisfied with, let's say, the state of Christianity or the state of religion or the state of the world. You can be dissatisfied it, th- with it. But if you just make stuff up and you're like, well, I'm going to start my own thing and I'm going to do my own thing, like basically you're just participating in the breakdown of the world. Like we receive these things, True. we receive these broken vessels, we receive these traditions that are always kind of spiraling out of control that are becoming too authoritarian, as Stick said, or becoming too chaotic or, or too weird. And we receive them from our from the people before us. And it's now it's our job to bring them to the best version of it that we can, we can, that we can. But I, but I think like what happened in the sixties is basically just, there's a direct relationship between the social breakdown, the chaos, the wokeness, the 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 kind of uh, idi- the, the the love of idiosyncrasy, right? The self making of the woke ideology, all the of that of is self. related yeah. to what happened in the '60s and the New Age movement and the breakdown of of let's say the, the the breakdown of the Christian story in the West. And so we can't like we can't we can't on the one hand say like we were dissatisfied with Christianity. We want, we want to be able to do our own thing, but then be angry that there's also someone who is like, Hmm. who is an insane, like whatever (laughs) thing. And is trying to like teach my kids to be that. And Hmm. is trying to like get my kids to participate in their disturbing, uh, this Hmm. disturbing thing. All that's going to happen at the same time. It's going to be a war. It's going to be a war of, of stories. You're going to have pagan, real paganism, a war of stories. You have cities under different gods, and those cities are going to fight, just like they did in ancient Greece. It, that's what's going to happen. It's going to fra- the the conflict, which in religious, like in the monotheistic world, was bigger and sometimes more looming. Now it's going to break down. It's going to be small, and you're going to have all these different gods and different factions fighting with each other nonstop. <clears throat> I don't think that we're going back to a city state model personally because it wouldn't make organizational sense. But what it's would, even uh, worse. what would, what would, it gets Rudolf worse because Steiner... it's everybody everywhere yeah. fighting everybody everywhere. What, what would Rudolf Steiner per se have to do with wokeness? And he comes mm-hmm. long before the 60s. If you've read his literature, he'd be more classed as, in some ways, anti woke. The whole theosophical premise that later informs part of anthroposophy was about self-improvement, sobriety. It had some elements that were arguably Christian, sobriety and meditating upon things, learning self-control. Um, those are things that are largely in common with, you know, even the most religious of Christian uh, edifices. Well, if I so that would, that would, no, but it's, well, a, it's I, I would agree, deeper, I would agree though, I would agree though that the Victorian and Edwardian occultism was informing elements of the new age, but it was more like the fortune telling and palmistry side of things. It wasn't the self-control it was almost an inversion of that kind of magic that their own grandparents had been practicing by the way and they were just interested in drugs and orgies and stuff like that they didn't well, they didn't go to they didn't go to india to meditate they went to india to smoke hash <laughs> Both but, of them no, but i think the, the, the steiner, it's important to understand how steiner relates to this you know if you if Gino wrote a book called what is it theosophic theos, theosophy the history of a pseudo religion and this was like, right, right. This is at the beginning of the, the 20th century, right at the beginning of the 20th century. And his point is that the, it's the idiosyncratic aspect. It's the idea of saying, of doing your own thing, of saying, well, I don't like Christianity. And so, or I don't like the version of Christianity that I, that I see as coming down the line from the apostles. And so I'm going to make something up and I'm going to create my own little religion. And that you can have all the best intentions when you do that. But what's going to happen is that it is going to lead to something like wokeism, because if you don't have if you don't have any authority, like nothing f- coming from before you that is kind of informing your world, then, oh, yeah, you can do something about be sobri- about sobriety or whatever, whatever. But then you could also do it about anything. You can just make up your own thing. But and then you can try. But that's not it, but that's not how theosophy formed. Initially, it was Blavatsky saying that enlightened masters who were in communication with spiritual entities had given a series of. Uh, philosophical material which became her secret doctrine in various other works and Steiner became one of the early and often acolytes along with a few others Judge and and Alice Bailey and then splits off due to disagreements with Annie Besant mostly over various uh, uh, subjects he, he he was more west centric I think and, and Besant a little bit more 
interested in trying to say her adoptive son was going to be the next Krishna, actually. But they yeah. said that it, it came from, yeah, and, and there's some, some weirdness there, but it came ostensibly from spiritual forces. I think that the big debate then comes down to why should we say that 2000 years ago, people had the end all be all of spirituality. They were right when their new religious group came into the world, but theosophy or any other modern group and theosophy is now more than a century old anyway, that that would be a perversion or degenerated or there's something wrong with it. Technically yeah. speaking, it, if you wanted a comparison, first you would have to see where theosophy would lead the world if the whole world were following theosophy or, or like, let's say the Christian world tomorrow says, okay, we still believe in Christ, but we have a theosophical backdrop of what Christianity or, or this mystic system should be. And then for like 10, 20 years, the whole world follows it. You'd have to do that in order to have like an A-B test going on to see which one was more pragmatic, spiritually aware, or would lead to downfall, technically speaking. But we don't have that as an example to compare with Christianity for these countries. We can compare it to Hinduism, compare it to Islam, I think positively, uh, but <laughs> you can't compare it to uh, some of these mystic traditions. Well, I was going to, if I may interject two things. One is that I wanted to ask about the sort of... Uh, the fragments of early Christianity, because that was a time where they were directly in contact with the old world in terms of various pagan beliefs. But also I would say that Jonathan, you brought up an interesting point that Styx I think is trying to uh, finagle out of is uh, I remember one time, I forget who was it. I think it may have been Bishop Barron on EWTN that was talking about, and you know, I, I, me being, you know, studying young for multiple, almost, a, you know, over a decade now saying the danger in sort of, um, a lot of this modern talk around re-enchantment specifically with either young or other forms of depth psychology or Joseph Campbell or perennialism, where it really led to the century of the self in the sense of the self is this atomized in in thing, even though, you know, young nowadays, I think maybe because of Jordan Peterson uh, is posited as being like anti-woke or some, you know, political comportment that it's like, you know, he's, re he's re-essentializing. But unfortunately, a lot of the criticism that people in traditional Christianity have is that, well, that's fine and good, but it still leads down the path of this very individualizing and atomizing sense that the New Age left off from. And so I think people have that criticism of perennialism as well. And so I, I don't know, I, I struggle with this. I struggle with, on the one sense, it is good that people are talking about a sort of re-enchantment of the West in particular. But what that re-enchantment would manifest as without the grounding in traditions, like especially Christianity, um, I, I, I shudder to think what the TikTok witches are going to do in the future. I don't know, Jonathan. I mean, but but, well, but re-enchantment is happening. Yes. You can't. It's not about re-enchanting the world. Re-enchanting re-enchantment is happening. There's no right. like it's mm -hmm. just happening to us. So so either we participated in a way that is building or we participate in a way that is TikTok witches like it's it's yeah. it's flooding in and it, and like all the all the floyd worshiping all the uh you know all the processions all the kneeling all that it's all re-enchantment the world is becoming religious again and so especially the west like it's just happening so the idea is now now what like how do we help people navigate through this time without being crushed because re-enchantment is not a good thing in itself Right. It's right. a it yeah. just means that things get connected and the world gets meaning starts to reappear and people start to see even have theophanies. Well, pe more people are going to have visions, more people. I mean, you can see it through the drugs, through the drug use. More people are going to have visions. More people are going to have insights. More people are going to it's going to get it's going to get weird and wackier. We're going to see mythological creatures. All these this desire to create hybrids is going to really create hybrids. We're going to have hybrids and it's going to look like a mythological world. Like the world is, it's, it's happening. I mean, we're going to have real dragons and stuff. That actually <laughs> sounds kind of cool. You're, you're almost making an argument. I'm making, making an argument for the hybrids. Yeah. yeah. You're making an argument the for TikTok. Man-made horrors <laughs> beyond our wildest dreams. Yeah. The, the um, thing about the hybrids is they, most of the time they want to eat you. Like they just want to devour yeah. you and, and burn I, your world I down. Think, we'll just I think make vegetarian we... dinosaurs mm. this time. Oh, <laughs> oh hold on. I have a, I have like a quick, Dinotopia. Yes. I have yeah. a quick, uh, or Zootopia. I have a, uh, for the Zootopia. furries. I have a quick question, though. We uh, should get James Gurney on. Yes. That would be great. An artist. Stream. Lots of, yeah, sure. Well, regard, regarding this whole uh, question, I want to talk about falsification when it comes to looking at something like 
Steiner's, uh, you know, religion, for lack of a better word, and anthroposophy, or if we're talking about the things that were passed down, uh, you know, to uh, Jesus and to other prophets uh, before him and after him, <clears throat> what would uh, make something, uh, this was what uh, uh, Tarl was asking earlier, what would make something a revealed religion that would be considered to be more or less a true religion if, for example, uh, Jonathan, you were talking about a lot of these various uh, practices uh, leading to, you know, this understanding that something like self-sacrifice is incredibly important in the grand scheme of things. Many different esoteric faiths, I guess you could say, have touched on that exact thing. So as far as people being led astray from something like Christianity into much more bizarre, hybrid-oriented uh, uh, worship uh, practices, could there be an argument made for trying to use the process of scientific falsification as much as possible in something like Christianity to say, at the least, we know that this particular practice has the kind of truth that maybe is also reflected in these other things, but we can say for certain, for example, I, I'm even going to go as far as say we can say for certain that there was Jesus, or we can't go as far as to say that there is this particular trinity. You know, maybe there are other things here that, um, you know, that are in place of that, but could we get to a certain truth despite any of these elements being in question that uh, we can draw people towards instead of them becoming hybrid furry creatures you know like c can there be that's something too substantial utilitarian there? Levin. i think that's too utilitarian uh, but i don't so, i think I, one of the things that i think is it's it's important to do and i i think it's what what's important to do is to also understand that the stories that happen in the world like the stories that manifest themselves they have an objective quality they're not just all the same they have, an they have an objective quality and that, that objective quality affects the world, right? So it's like, if you, you have something happen, like Napoleon does something, like that's an objective thing that happens and that it has an effect on the world and that effect is, is real. And so I think that the story of Christ is, an, is a story. It's a real story that you can know. You can know what that story is and you can notice the effects that it has on the world. And then you, you realize that even, even at that time, let's say, like even at the time of, of Christ, as the story of Christ was kind of permeating the world and it was transforming the different, different civilizations, like when Islam came about, they didn't, they didn't even, they didn't try to just say, well, we're just going to start a new religion. Nobody does that. That's a modern thing. Nobody just starts new religion. Like Islam, Islam saw themselves as a continuation of the Christian revelation. They had, there was a revelation and they said, we're the next step. We're the paraclete, right? This, Muhammad is, is what Christ said when he, when he, when he uh, prophesied the paraclete. And so that's exactly what theosophy did though with Christianity and Hinduism. Yeah. But theosophy mm, yeah. didn't, it didn't happen. Did it right there? They're like Messiah didn't. Yeah. Like, well, they're still, they're just still waiting. They're still waiting for it. Just like, you know, Christians are waiting for the return of Christ. Islam is waiting for the Mahdi. You're still waiting for Krishna if you're in, in their religion. It's exactly the same. It's just a matter of it's just a matter no, it's not of well, exactly the same, waited though. longer. The other right, it's not exactly the longer. same because because Christianity, first of all, Christianity had the the revelation. And then you're right. There is a sense in all religion that that's not the end. Like what we are offering, this revelation we're offering, it's not the end. There's something coming, which will be a transformation. But that something coming has to happen. You can't make it up. Like it has to actually. Well, I mean, but but technically, all of these. What I'm saying is, all these religions are are waiting for the same thing. By the way, I did want to point out something on a previous uh, bit that we were talking about. It seems kind of funny to just fixate on the new age as being this modern transformative period towards more like witchcraft and and you know civic degeneracy, if you want to term it that, because technically speaking, that happened during the Enlightenment period. <laughs> a bunch of Christians stopped going to church and started going to orgies and started talking about divination and astrology and uh, UFOs. And also in the occult libertarian future, there will be genetically engineered dinosaurs and they will be ridden by cat girls with automatic lasers that they can uh, order through the mail.
Oh, God. Sh- shout out or, to for the Bitcoin. Uh, shout out to uh, the Cad Girl Milk and Yogurt Company, one of the best upcoming uh, <laughs> corporations in the world. But uh, also regarding that whole thing, well, Modern Hermeticist had a great point. Uh, Krishnamurti oh, was yeah. their prophet, but then he shut it down. <laughs> well, not Steiner. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah. saying. It's like no, but not Steiner. Shut it down. That's why I said that. Chris- that's why I said Theosophy didn't play out. Well, not, not not Steiner's. We're talking specifically well, that was a about claim. Uh, yeah. That was just Bassant's claim. That was part of the reason why there was the schism. But I mean, mm. that doesn't nullify the concept. It just means that she was egotistically trying to say that a particular individual, I mean, how many people have claimed to be Jesus? <laughs> it's the same thing. But also talking about the things that came before, as far as uh, going towards older traditions, you could make the case for something like Mithraism, for example, and various other practices that uh, somebody like Jesus, uh, were Jesus uh, actually around, would have been influenced by. So, for example, you would have, uh, you know, you would have this idea of egalitarianism within something like Mithraism, from what I understand, at least Jason Giorgiani says that, I have to read up on it. But when you compare that to Judaism, with all of its various laws and strictures, like how many there are, I mean, it's kind of a shame because I'm partly Jewish from my mom's side, and I don't even know how many laws there are, but there are a lot of laws they were all, you know, they all went out the window. So how many of those aspects from Christianity were, let's say, taken on from other mystery school traditions, from other things that came in the past, and could the same case be made for anything else that comes out? Again, like, what exactly does qualify revelation to be true revelation as opposed to false revelation? Well, first of all, th- there are a few things in that. Like, first of all, the idea that you have access to Mithraism is such bullshit that I don't see. Yeah. Like, I don't see. that. So this is the thing. Like, yeah. this is the weird, like, modern world where people think that religions are things that you take in books and you can just study that something from thousands of years ago and that you could somehow just practice. Like, that's not how any of this works, right? This is, a, these are living things. They're living beings. They're living organic realities that are, transmitted from one generation to another, their, their behaviors, their ways of thinking that cannot be even contained in books, right? You see that even in, in the story of Christ, where at the end of the story, it says, if, if we wrote down all the things that Christ had done, none, they could not, all the books would fill up the entire world, right? There's a sense in which the, it's not about books and about studying. It's about embodied re- practice that we connected to our fathers, you could say, receiving from the people before. It's just like you learn to brush your teeth or that you learn to, to do all these things. Like it, you wouldn't study how to brush your teeth in a book. Like that would be mm. silly. And so Mithraism is dead. Mithraism doesn't exist anymore, right? It has something, maybe there's some things about Mithraism that we could, we could study that could help complement our practices, that could maybe help us have some insight into the things that we're, that we're living now. But the idea that you could just resuscitate these old, like dead religions, is absolute mm. nonsense. You'd just be ma- you'd just be creating Frankenstein's. Well, just uh, just real quick here, and I would love to get uh, Sticks' response as well. But the reason why I mentioned something like Mithraism is not because I think that it exists today and there is some way to access it. I have no idea one way or another. But just to point out that beyond continuing this more established religion of uh you know judaism that the hebrews practiced back in the day with their various sects the reason why i'm pointing that out is that there were other things back then that somebody like jesus would have been able to grab onto and uh, learn from which is what i think the point that sticks was making earlier about not just uh looking at one thing but trying to figure out what is the inherent truth inside of various other traditions so i'm curious uh, sticks would that be a fair assessment to, to make what I would say is this, when people join a religion, uh, typically speaking, because they've determined they wouldn't have joined it otherwise, that that is the truth, that is the path that they want to be on, uh, there's there's often the reason, uh, a particular reason why they would want to belittle other religious or spiritual groups. I don't believe that you can't learn about an ancient religion, and yes, indeed, if you have contemporary accounts of the rituals and so forth, resuscitate them. Um, Mithraism, I would technically agree on because it doesn't seem particularly to be practiced in the modern sense in any literal form, but there are Norse groups that do, and we have the Eddas, you have the Bach saga, you have- Bitten by Christians, by the way. 
Don't well, forget. Well, well, not well, the Vox saga of, wasn't. But there's, but isn't there a lot of Norse pagans that claim that they don't actually believe in the Norse gods? That really, oh, is, of course. But then again, like even a lot Varg, of, I they, think, they said a, he doesn't uh, believe in actual. No, Varg, Varg, I think is more literal. Actually, they oh, had a study. Yeah. They had a study last decade that showed that something like twenty percent of Catholic priests were technically atheists. They don't even believe in their god. So how is this any different? Well, um, I that was largely because of Vatican II and. Uh, well, no, no, no. John Paul II Vatican, tuned them. This, this, no, this, this was before Vatican II. This was, well, I think, at the outset of Ratzinger. There's always going to be dead wood. I mean, I know that John Paul II cleared out a lot of dead wood. And so then, then, so continue, then, your religion, I suppose, but, if you use the same logic, your religion would be spiritually dead. But twenty percent is not a hundred percent. Yeah, that's. Not, <laughs> well, I don't know we don't know what the percentage is among practitioners of the Norse. They're modern day. Uh, practitioners of the ancient Greek and Roman religion, and that's fairly well documented. The practices, the rituals, and so forth are fairly well laid out. That's not possible. The, the, you, can't, you can't, you can't, well, those religions were based on initiatory secrets. Like, you don't know, no one even knows what was in the Ulyssian mysteries. So, how are you practicing? How are you practicing a religion without the secret? Like, you talk about esotericism. And so, it's like, how can you practice a religion without? without receiving the secret, being initiated into the secret. And so you create these Greek religions, but you you, you don't even well, know- it's, it's, it's the, not the creating, Ulysses, it's verbatim. But the Ulysses, the Ulyssian mysteries were the center of the Greek practice. They were beyond the local practice of the different, let's say worship of the gods or the propitiation that they would do. And no one even knows what was there. Like they were able to, they was pretty amazing. They were actually able to keep the secret. And now we don't even know what it was. So you're creating a shell, like a like you're creating this shell. It's as if you could say, well, just because, but just because for you, like, look at you, you're a mystic, mystic Orthodox Christian, and you claim to be, if not an initiate, at least privy to the potential initiation into the secret, the core of that particular religion. Well, why would that claim necessarily be taken seriously? The secret could have been transmogrified over time. In I mean, theory. probably. I mean, the 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 let's say the uh, the envelope of it is always a little bit transmogrified. But the, the secret is more than a, it's not a, it's not a, just information. The secret is something like the secret is something presence. like watching your dad, watching your dad, you know, hammer a nail in. And then he doesn't have to explain it. And then you learn from osmosis. Almost you learn from, from, uh, from being with someone and, and imbibing their way of being like in orthodoxy, we talk about the, the, the mind of the fathers, like, acquiring the mind of the fathers, but that doesn't happen just through books, right? It happens by practice, by participation. But and that, that, can be, that can be done even with many ancient religions in ritual form because they were documented. But unless you assume that that religion is spiritually dead, that is, it was not inspired, et cetera, if you do believe it's inspired and you believed that that pantheon or that God or that force or, or inspiration existed, then the fact that there was a long absence of that ritual could just be considered another stage in that religion as a hibernated and a practitioner could say, well, they tried to kill us off, but now the inspiration is back. I mean, it wouldn't be civically, it wouldn't be civically pragmatic. It wouldn't be, the problem is that in order to explain that away, you have to take up the secular logical line. So no, what's because, the difference? So like in the way that Christianity works is that it absorbs these traditions. Like it, so it, it doesn't go away. That's why all the that is has good. A Dagon hat, yeah. But all all that is good of Norse of 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 the Norse practice is there in Christianity. That's why the Eddas are part of their tradition. That's why if you go to a a, a stave church, you'll find that all the dragons, all the myths are engraved into the church architecture because the 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 good of the ancient world gets brought into Christianity, and it, Islam has that as well. Like there's a sense in which it's an integrity it integrates the ancient world. So it, Let's say the old myths, you know, on in the Middle Ages, on the on some altars in the churches, you would have the Aeneid and the Bible. And so oh, the yeah, Aeneid, I, I would agree with you. Yeah. But I don't, yeah, I, don't I would see also this as say like though an, that I would also say though that some neo-pagan groups, and I've I've both criticized and praised them for this, take up the Abrahamic uh, moral system, which you would, I'm sure, posit as good, specifically from Christianity, and incorporate it. So instead of running around butchering their enemies and sacrificing animals because they wouldn't consider that positive. They, they just want to plant trees and stuff like that. So aren't they doing the same appropriation in a positive manner? And if so, why would, why would their religion be 
spiritually evil or dead or something wrong with it. Because, well, why would they do that? That is, what, what is the reason? Why did Christianity absorb all these pagan practices? By the way, I, I mean, I, it's nice to talk to a Christian that acknowledges that because some of them don't. They, they still think that everything originated. But I don't see that Jesus, as inherently so. in own sticks. I think that um, there was like that concept of the virtuous pagan where the beliefs that were ostensibly Christian, they were, there were fragments of them in the ancient world. And to sort of absorb them into they're almost coming home in a sense. But Jonathan, you obviously you're more knowledgeable in this. So yeah, but that's why Dante has that's why Dante has limbo like in his hierarchy. And the, it's if you read the the part of limbo in the in the comedy, it's very powerful because it's a little microcosm. And at the end of the limbo passage, they move into the light, like they move into a place that's higher and has more light. So it shows you that these these ancient practices and these ancient, let's say pagans. They have a manner of participating in in the Christian world, like it's a it's a clear manner, like it's 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 part of the world, like it's part of the system. Let's say, um, well, assume- and so I think, sorry, but these become these become peripheral, like they're not the central thing. So yeah, so I think that that's the difficulty with like a lot of the neo pagan groups is that a lot of the neo pagan groups they're basically Christian with the with like a Norse veneer. You know, and so they believe in all the Christian worldview, basically. But then they've added this. They don't like they want to be rebels. So then they they do their own thing. Whereas what happens in Christianity is that there's a serious transformation, which is the notion of sacrifice gets transformed in Christianity. Right. We move from uh, scapegoat sacrifice from, uh, let's say, the, and, and a deep understanding of self-sacrifice as the as the core of how reality works. And that informs all of the moral system. And so, and then the the pagan stuff gets, let's say, remains there as a kind of sauce, like as a spice, as something that is that that can participate in the world, but it doesn't. It's not the central core. So I think what I see in, a, in the neo pagan stuff is that it's, and you see that like not just you see that like right away with like uh, when you look at Julian the Apostate, like right away Julian the Apostate who tries to go back to paganism in the early centuries. He's basically wanting to create a Christian uh, paganism, but it's like the world has changed. It's too late. The, 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 let's say the driving energy that informed paganism has been transformed. And so you can pretend, I think, and like you can kind of pretend and, and word that you worship Thor, but how can you worship Thor if you don't kill people? Like, like I don't understand how that, like, what, what is, like, what are you doing? Like, uh, it's kind of like this weird, it's like a, I guess you psycholo- psychologize it, maybe you well, make then, it into well, like. A, then yeah, I would say, how, how, can you, how can you suffer a witch to live then if you're a Christian? It would be the same thing. Elements of the religion over time are abandoned. That doesn't necessarily render it inauthentic. It's about analysis and interpretation. How do you suffer a witch to live? I don't understand. Thou, thou shalt, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Uh, but there are witches in the world, and I don't see Christians killing them. A mystery. And where does that te- where does the thou shalt not suffer which to live come from? The tradition within Judaism and Christianity is specifically that witchcraft was specifically evil. The, the, well, the original concept was basically it wasn't even about doing evil spells; it was your countermanding God's will. But but if that is in your scriptures, it's it's it's, uh, it's Exodus it's Exodus twenty two yeah. eighteen. Exodus twenty two well, eighteen, that is, and that wasn't nullified well, by I any command of Jesus. Well, I agree with that. I think we should. Uh, no, no never but mind. you should kill folks. witches. You just think we should kill witches? I'm not going to. But, gonna but it's interesting that you I say would that. Say, but really, really quickly though, Lev, I do have kind of a hard stop here, like oh, fairly so, soon so. as well. All right, so All right, but it's interesting that you say that because if you look at the way that the witch burnings happen, most of the time they were they were done by the secular state, and most of the time they were they were pogroms or they were kind of out of control things like that. The, mm. the the Catholic well, Church oh, oh, no, never no, no. Well, Jonathan, that's, Jonathan, that's Jonathan. Not to be true. fair, to be fair, if you're talking about the pogroms, at least from Listen, my own. Oh, wait, Gio, Gio, hold on. More. Gio, there Gio, Gio. Sorry, Gio. sorry. From my own, from my own family history, it was the Russian Church authorities that commanded the pogroms back in the day. Just from my own family history, there for specifically talking about orthodoxy. But this is a really fascinating conversation. We definitely have to do more of these. I feel like we just started. Sticks, you got to go back to the United States. Yeah, as soon we, as we possible. should have a part two, by the way, John. And this I would love to. Great. 
Yeah, and if you want, like we could also, like I did with uh, Uber Boyo, we could we could also host it on one of our channels if you want. Yeah. Sorry oh, to cut no, you guys out. No, of no, 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 don't. No, you suck the clown. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> all right so we're good i, I do thanks, thanks for organizing this guys for sure like i really appreciate it like i i it's i'm actually happy to talk to you sticks because i've been i've been kind of following your work you know margin leaf since like 2016 and so so I, i'm happy to finally meet you and talk yeah. to you so that's cool and so what was the uh, website for your book again it's called godsdog.com okay i'm, I'm probably going to get a copy and check cool. that out. that's great nice. yeah and it's so- available in paperback like not just digital no, yeah, yeah. There's a hard. It's like it's yeah, it's a it crowdfunding, right but it'll be like a hard like a hardbound copy. Yeah. All right. So real quick before we get to the super chats, I just want to let everybody know nine fifteen or pretty much as soon as this is over, we are going to have another stream, a break the rules after hours call in stream via Twitter Spaces and YouTube. So in the chat, I am going to put in the YouTube link first. And now I'm going to put in the uh, link to the Twitter spaces. So for all those who are on Twitter right now, you could join the conversation, uh, participate in that. Uh, we're going to have a lot of very uh, interesting guests coming in for that as well. A lot of schizos from Twitter. Too. Yes, 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 exactly. <laughs> and uh, so please participate in that. And one of the people that we're going to have is going to be uh, uh, Heming at Hemingway on uh, on Twitter who uh, writes for... Uh, uh, the Spectator columnist, so uh, check that out. So let's go to Super Chats. So we have uh, King Salmonfish. I have immense respect for Styx and his Trump prediction coherence, but I have to go Peugeot, because he's right ultimately about Christ as far as magic, dot, dot, dot. So there we go. Next Super Chat, another one from Salmonfish, $10. Walking my dog yesterday, he wandered rapidly in random directions while I was deciding I need to give Elon at the peak esoteric psychology info to prevent <laughs> metal demon, uh, uh, I'm not going to say that word just for YouTube, same walk, a pain. Basham, $20. That's Alex Basham. Speaking of schizos. Yes. <laughs> Great discourse, guys. Coming back on Jonathan, God bless. Uh, then we have JT Brown, $10 Super Chat. As a Christian, I find Styx to be very intelligent, well-spoken, and a good human being. No matter what he believes, I support him in anything he does. So I believe those are all the Super Chats that we have. No, what King Salmon Fish, once again. <laughs> Not suffering a witch uh, to live was Old Testament. That's right, like the Exodus that I said. And also, four ninety nine Adam Sith, all religions are shells of what they used to be. Due to reformations, our branding for mass conversation. Today's Christian vast different from 50 AD and another King Salmon Fish $5 <laughs> crypto is unsecure and centralized worse than regular money because no paper or metal and that helps globalists I won't ever invest the hype and push it so I agree I don't know Sticks you disagree about that but anyway I, I, yeah I, I've got oh, quite a bit of Bitcoin there, yes there, before we go there was a great comment by each not not our good friend zero <laughs> HP Lovecraft but HP Lovecraft that said about um, let me scroll up about how um Christ is a positive message, but um, saying that Christ is the only path is sort of problematic. I don't know, like, I, having been, like, kind of a New Ager for a lot of years, I just don't see um, anything I could get out of Shiva that I can yeah. get out of No, my, out of my only, I don't know. Uh, like, to me, it's just... My only, fi- my only fi- final but point... I, know, I understand that's My only final point, and I know that Jonathan kind of crucified me for uh, bringing it up on the last stream, but if, if we were to imagine, if we were to imagine there would be, like, life on other planets, or even if there was a cataclysm or something people were to get together, I still think that they would come to a certain idea of what the truth is through certain practices that would enable them to get to a higher state, which is why I can never say that this particular moment that happened, that this is the be-all end-all for me personally. That's the only other thing that I would add to this thing. But uh, final thoughts, uh, Jonathan sticks, and we are going to end it. And again, everybody oh, go... Oh, promo to- the other stream, Lev. We're going to have an important stream soon as well with sticks. That's right. We are going to have the stream with uh, Mike Cernovich and... Uh, that is going to be about uh, health, wellness, specifically with medicinal plants. We're going to get into ayahuasca, DMT, psychedelics. So we're going to, it's going to be uh, kind of a mix of what we talked about today, as well as a, a general uh, health stream, as well as Health Nut. Health Nut, who is super muscular. I consider him to be like st- sticks 10 years later. That's what Health Nuts looks like, because he also has the long <laughs> I hair. I might have to here. sit out that stream. My no! body is way too high for this that is the, stream. This is why you should My do God. it. <laughs> oh, and finally, ABC, $5, sneeding for Peugeot, base tings, also sneeding for for sticks the goaded so there we go so final thoughts gentlemen and we're going to conclude this and everybody go into the call-in stream patreon.com slash break the rules and subscribe subscribe click the bell and like this stream anyway jonathan go for it brother 
I mean, I, I, I don't want to like go back into the argument. I just want to thank you guys. And, uh, and uh, I really do. I really would like to talk to you again, Sticks, if that's possible. I think that would be fun. Uh, because yeah, I definitely. think you probably see that I'm not necessarily like, I'm maybe not the kind of the kind of Christian that you've talked to before, but I think yeah. there's a lot more <laughs> of difference. that. There's a lot more of that, uh, let's say, around now. And so I think that, that to me, that's a, yeah, it's an interesting change yeah. that's going on. Sticks, final words. And, uh, and yeah, I would just say a uh, good chat. And yeah, I look forward to that definitely. And also to the stream also with Cernovich in one week. Excellent. And it's going to be my birthday, actually, the same yeah. day, the 23rd. That's I'm why you better come. I, I, I got to drop out now, though. All right. I just got mail, too. All right, that's that's you, about all. Two, two more super Peace chats. Out. Peace, Peace out, out brother. Two more super so, chats. I'm a Christian. Yeah. And this is from HF999. I'm a Christian and have been following Sticks since the beginning of the pandemic. I don't even think about his religious beliefs and mainly admire him for the level-headed outlook. And Nach Bodhi, $2. Regardless of Sticks' opinions, we still love him. There we go. Whoa. That was pretty great. Um, so, well, do you have a bit of time, Jonathan, or you have to cut out? I have a little bit of time. Yeah, if you sure, if you maybe like another fifteen minutes, if you want. All right, let's sure. let's do it. And uh, although what would be interesting, since we're talking about fifteen minutes, I don't know if this is possible, Jonathan. Do you have the Twitter app on your phone? Uh, yeah. Why? Because what we can do is we can transfer this into the. Uh, into the app where people could actually ask you questions. So for that limited amount of time, you could be the star in that particular stream. So if anybody wants know, to say like anything that to you. seems too complicated. <laughs> like, no, I just, you just ask the questions. I think it's much better. Go all right. It. Yeah, that's All right, better. that's fine. Um, so I, I think what the the biggest thing that, um, unfortunately, it sticks to enough time, a lot of people were bringing up the relationship of Christianity to, and we covered it a little bit, um, to early paganism. But what would you say for people who, let's say, I don't know, watch Zeitgeist when they were 15, um, what would you say is the the heart that you were mentioning of Christianity, in your opinion, that differentiates it from all of these other wisdom traditions? And what really made Christianity thrive, not just in its uniqueness, but what really made it sort of global out of the particularity of these different wisdom traditions? Because, like, I would say that for example, Mithraism, when those societies went belly up, it seems that their occult mystery schools went belly up as well. But what is the benefit of Christianity being ensconced within universalist terms? I, mean, you know, I know a lot of people like criticize it. They say that, we well, you know Christianity led to wokeness because it was universalism. But what would you say, like what really pinpoints in that earliest stage of Christianity, um, what made it really take off? So, I mean, I think that, what, what Christianity offers is a does offer you could say the mystery, but it also it also actually kind of makes it public. You could say it seems like one of the things that happened is that let's say that which was in the Eleusinian mysteries or that which was in the highest in like these highest uh, forms of of uh, esoteric versions of the religions was made somewhat public or was brought out into into the world and become like the root of of the world. So I think that that's that's it, and and Christ, like the, the the relationship that the revelation of what death means, you could say, is that was is one of the things that Christianity offers, and that's a that's a big deal, and the idea of self sacrifice is a huge huge that deal, and so ultimately the the notion would be that the universalism of Christianity, sadly, it's not always happened that way, especially in 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 a later Roman period. But Christianity should be fractal. That is that it should be universal, but also include the different, uh, let's say, ethnic or different social groups in which they, they, they're, they're part of. And so there's room for your poetic tradition. There's room for your, for your own local idiosyncratic uh, rituals or, or celebrations, but they're couched in this more universal thing. Um, and you see that, like, for example, like Russian Orthodoxy is obviously very different from from uh, Byzantine, the kind of Greek Orthodoxy, and you have Georgian Orthodoxy, and you have Romanian Orthodoxy, and they all have like a connection to their to their soil, to their you know to their to their roots. And you had that in the Catholic Church before the yeah. Counter Reformation, where you still had Celtic uh, Christianity, and you had all these like traditions all through Northern Europe. Um, so I think that that's the, kind of the ideal that it offers is a way to connect to each other that isn't just this like weird new. Like the, the the universalism we're seeing happen now, like the kind of world government type of nonsense, it's a it really is a leveling. 
where it's like, right. let's all, I mean, it's the joke, but it's like, yeah, let's all just live in pods and eat bugs and, and <laughs> go on the metaverse. And then it's, it's like a connection between, it's a connection between this super powerful, uh, like uh, thing above and then all the idiosyncrasy you want below. So you can be any avatar, any furry imaginative thing you want. There's no connection. There's no like, there's no fractal uh, connection between the levels, let's say. And and would you say that, I know pr people have criticism of orthodoxy that specifically these are like, you know, state religion, Cesaro papism, like that is, I don't know if that's the full truth of it, but also I, I noticed that a lot of people are critical. I would think of these, you know, largely younger converts on the internet who um, maybe <laughs> through, I don't know, some various neuroses or porn addiction, uh, they lead to very extremist conclusions. I remember the other day uh, on Twitter, there was the one guy that said that you can't even see your wife naked. So Jonathan, you don't see Yeah, I unfollowed naked. that guy. Sorry, his, yeah. what is his name? Zoomer Theosis. And like, oh, I, at oh, this point, I'm going to unfollow Zoomer that. Theosis. Oh, I, rarely, th I rarely unfollow people on Twitter. Wait, was, he, like, was, he, following them. was he the dude that was rallying against uh, naked, uh, like nudity in paintings? Was, no, that, that was a patriarch prime. He does that, but he does that every <laughs> month. He does that every month. But this guy said that you can't, as an Orthodox, uh, see your wife naked. Is yeah, well, true? he should just become a monk, like that guy, <laughs> whoever he is. He just become a monk and get it over with, yeah. and get off Twitter. Yeah. Like that's what he should do. I mean, there, there is like, <laughs> there there is an interesting there is an interesting thing yeah. where uh, I remember Jesse Lee Peterson said this one time that if you have like any kind of lust towards your wife. Uh, then you hate her, or like lust towards any woman, then you hate well, that woman. Different. But what's what's I find interesting about that is we look at it in the grand scheme of things when it comes to the idea of any desire that we have whatsoever as a form. And I know I'm kind of uh, uh, you know, committing the uh, s uh, sin here of mixing up different religions, but uh, it is kind of like, to me, the idea of attachment where when you lust for something you are attached to it and it keeps you within the circle it keeps you within the certain state yeah. instead well, they have, of going they have beyond that concept in earth yeah yeah. so the idea would be that like you have to really see it dante has the greatest the greatest version of this there's a talk of uh, there's a talk of mine that got put up recently about how love is the the, the manner in which the world exists and so desire is the manner in which we move towards things like we move towards each other but it always has to be couched in higher loves and so like your wife you you can you can love her desire her but the lust part in the sense that if you treat her like a piece of meat that you just want to like get off on then that's a serious that's a problem even if she's your wife like you it has to be integrated into a higher into mm. a higher love and that lo the desire you have for your wife has to be integrated into her as a person your relationship with her like all of this has to come together and so i can understand why someone would say that but i think that the Zoomer theosis thing is just that's just not mm. uh, yeah whatever like it's, it's <laughs> and the uh, and last thing I wanted to touch on is art. There was a really fascinating uh, speech you gave about Adam and Eve about the uh, covering of Adam and Eve being the first example of art. And I do find that there was a lot of you know very bad art out there. But at the same time, if you look at something like Spirited Away, you know Miyazaki. If you look at uh, you know various uh, Disney films back in the day, or just any kind of animation that really speaks to you as well as you know taxi driver as well as the films of francis ford coppola you know godfather things like that you see a very high aspect in those while at the same time if you're watching some horrible you know like dan schneider you know uh, uh Nickelode oh, nickelodeon stuff you know like there is something very debased about a lot of these very shallow things while at the same time if the film or animation is truly good it really does speak to you at a higher level so i'm curious what your stance is on art when it does come to the art that does speak to you more and i'm also going to take this opportunity to show my latest piece it is almost done it is muscles <laughs> going on the tradition of uh what's his name um you know the garden of earthly delights uh you know who i'm talking about bosk so this you piece, know, you know what? This I piece should is show almost, my latest yes, wooden grade. Yes, you actually. should. Yes, you should, Dio. So this piece is almost done. It's going to be on SuperRare, superrare.com slash leftpliakov. I'm going to put the link there. It is going to be an NFT, and all these different characters that you see here are going to be their own separate cards as well. So this is the mothership piece, and then you would have the smaller pieces. But I am curious of uh, any final thoughts you would have on art so well i it. just yeah. i'm writing like we're publishing a graphic novel yeah. so i don't have a problem with with uh even pop culture i i think it's all about hierarchy it's all about things being in their proper place the the difficulty so for example like the difficulty with um 
let's say entertainment is that it's entertainment. It's it should not be your the thing that drives you because it's it's passive and you watch it and it's not your story. It's not something that you can engage in. Like you can't live in the world of Spirited Away or Star Wars or whatever. Like you just can't live in that world. There's nothing wrong with it and it can be useful to help you notice patterns of being and notice things about reality that you hadn't noticed before because it comes at you from a surprising angle or, for, or, or from an imaginative way. But ultimately there's a difference between those stories and your story, like the religious stories that you actually participate in, whether it's where it's the Christian story in a universal way, or it's you know the connection to the saints and their stories. Those are different types of stories. They're more, like I said, they, they, they're more participative. Like you can actually celebrate a hero of yours, like a real hero, you can really celebrate. Like you can celebrate Luke Skywalker, kinda, but you know you can celebrate a historical character or a saint in a real way because that person, that person is what the, that's the per, one of the people that built the world that you're living in right now, and that you can so you can celebrate in that manner. So I think there's so I think there's a difference. It just about it's just about hierarchy. But, but do you think that? Um, and this is a, a question I've being in like ex- extremely online spaces. This is a question as you know, a fellow artist, I struggle with. Um, do you think that the aesthetic in the sense can mislead people into um, a pantomime or a sort of pastiche of even like based in trad beliefs, like the oh, aestheticization yeah. sure. of orthodoxy, for instance, like, do you think that the pure aesthetic alone is lacking something or can potentially mislead people without being ensconced in a deeper tradition um, oh you're right like the online the it's a dangerous game like because we i play it like in the sense that i post my icons online i i post the things i'm doing online but it's a dangerous it's a dangerous it's a dangerous road to 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 navigate because you can have all the the tropes like all the, the like you said all the aesthetic of the of the orthodox but you're you know you're a poser basically you're not necessarily actually practicing and so I think you're right for sure, but it's like any any garment of skin, right? We talked, Lev talked about this idea of this garment around is that the garment is there to protect you from the outside world. It manifests in a certain manner. Let's say it's like a it's like a covering of, of a solid covering, and it has a function. But you all, obviously you have to be careful not to see it as the thing itself. It's all a ladder. It's all a ladder moving you up towards invisible truth and invisible mm-hmm. patterns, not. Those things in themselves are not there. It, yeah, that's it, why it, like the suspicion of idol, yeah. idolatry is not completely devoid of, of value. Mm. It is. It, 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 oh, wait, real oh, quick, ahead, real quick though. It is interesting to think though about the power of creativity and what exactly that does mean for somebody to be able to create something, or if you believe in brain being more of a receiver, to take something into the world and shape it in a certain way. Where I completely understand where Jonathan is coming from, but I am curious what levels of creativity are there and if there is something to the idea of this life being in a way a training ground a proving ground for people who would have more responsibility in being able to make something create something and give it a certain kind of uh, give it a life that isn't debased and uh, rotten but make it something that is actually beautiful and thoughtful and uh, containing wisdom I mean you know, the Orthodox, everybody, you meet Orthodox people, they always say beauty will save the world. Like a, there's a, a really is a, a beauty centered approach. Uh, there's a really powerful book uh, called The Ethics of Beauty that was uh, published by uh, Dr. Petitzas, who's head of a seminary here in the, in the, in the U.S. And he, he really argues for a beauty first approach. That is, the beauty is the most accessible of the transcendentals, right? It's the one, it's the one that, that can call people that can kind of call people towards movement because truth is hard, right? It's like it, you, you need to be seduced like into, into, into the transcendental and beauty is definitely the best way to, uh, to go about that. So I no, I'm all for, I'm all for that, you know, but I think most of the stuff we're doing now is in the, is marginalia. Like most of the stuff we're creating is, is, are the monsters in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, let's say in the ornaments, like the monsters on the cathedrals. And I say that, and that's okay. If you know that's what you're doing, because God's dog is all about that, right? God's dog is all about the dog headed monster on the edge of the world. And how is it that that monster can lead you across the river towards something more powerful, you know, that lead you from the edge into the middle, you could say, but you have to be aware of it because it, 
like the furries, for example, like they're the opposite of that. Like they just, they're just like a, they're just like a, a reveling in the chaos and in the monstrosity yeah. of the edge and just it's kind of rolling in the mud, basically, which yeah. is not necessarily what you want. Either. But it's also a way of escaping this almost demonic, satanic way of escaping the creation, the Amagio die that the Lord has given us in our bodies. Like a lot of other, well, we can't say it on YouTube, you know. But um, speaking of beauty, I have to show one thing. I think you'd be very interested, Jonathan. Um, my friend on Twitter, Lomaz, he's organizing um, this magazine, but it's a, a contest called the Passage Prize. And I believe the take is upwards of $25,000. And it's different sections of literature, art, and short stories. And I, I am judging the visual art section. So th we're going to pick three artists. And I believe Moldbug is judging the poetry section. And my good friend ZOHP Lovecraft is judging non um, short stories. And I think Ben Braddock is judging uh, nice. non nonfiction. So uh, the deadline is the 1st of January, you know, the new year. Go to Lomez's Twitter, The Passage Prize. Jonathan, I think you'd be very interested because we are trying to... Um, give support to artists and creative people on our side of like, you know, reality, I guess you could say, and sort of um, reinstantiating these sort of lessons of sacred beauty. Um, and I'm very curious to see what artwork I'm going to be uh, judging. But I would say that um, I, I didn't get to ask you this last time, but are you aware of the, um, the YouTuber who was a, you know, for many years broke down very complex philosophic tests? Are you aware of John David Ebert? Oh, I, I don't know. Yes, I, I I thought you would know who he is, but he uh, he wrote this book that changed my life, uh, basically, called Art After Metaphysics, and uh, it was quite popular for a time. But he goes through the contemporary art world. Uh, he goes through artists from Anselm Kiefer to uh, Gerhard Richter, and and uh, he concludes that in the modern sort of liquid modernity, the artist is tasked with recreating a sort of narrative from the sort of the bricklage of the collapse of the 20th century. So yes. as an Orthodox artist, how would you say is orthodoxy is the Orthodox icon picking up the pieces of this great collapse of signifiers, he calls it, or do you think that it's a, a timeless tradition that is sort of um, not ignorant, but maybe is not concerned with the machinations of things like, the sort of aesthetic and metaphysical collapse in the modern world and how we don't have these like great signifiers anymore. We don't yeah. have this heliocentric world. So what is your take on orthodox iconography in relation to sort of the contemporary world and society in general? So like I have a specific strategy, which is an, which is really a strategy. And, and I'm kind of going to reveal my secret here because a lot of people look oh. at what I'm doing and they're like, what is Jonathan doing? Like, what, what is going on with the things that he's doing? The first thing I think that's important to understand is I think that the bridge, the cultural bridge, goes far more through popular art to, sec to, to sacred art than gallery art. Gallery art, I think, is a weird fetishistic thing that, is, that, mm. doesn't, that doesn't really, um, that, that doesn't hold up much, let's say. Mm. Well, and so today, um, I don't know if would, be, would you be able to say that for like Kandinsky and Monet and... Uh, Things that exist. No, before. I think that Kandinsky, Monet, and all these artists, where they were writing on the fumes of sacred art, and and that, but that mm. ran out pretty fast. Interesting. It ran out pretty fast because of the 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 movement. Like, if you can understand, like, let's say Kandinsky and Manet and and the and the early modernists, like they were moving yeah. the art into the private sphere, right? It was the idea that you could you would own a painting and it would be yeah. in your house, and so it was a continuation of this idea of the private sphere. But then when we start to have institutions of modern art and you have these museums where we show modern art and then people like go to museums where they see contemporary artists and you're like, what is going on? Like, what are these images? What are they, how are they integrated into the world? It's, it's very, um, it is very fetishistic, I think, because it's just these arbitrary objects that just are there that you look at. Uh, whereas pop art is integrated far more like a t-shirt or a, uh, you know, like, um, a comic book, something a kid reads, or, you know, even a toy, like even toys and stuff are more integrated into yeah. the world than I think a lot of contemporary art. So my, like my strategy has been to create a hierarchy of images, right? And so, 
And I'm reaching like the limit of my hierarchy image, like at the bottom right now, because we're doing an NFTs, which I think is really like the bottom of the hierarchy of the oh, images. Oh God. I think so, the NFT is erasing the artist, in my opinion. No, That's, don't say uh, that, Geo. So I can t- I can talk to you about my my strategy for the NFTs later if you want. Yeah. But so so the idea is like to create the highest form of art and to create icons to create. I'm re- working on a reliquary right now to house you know the 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 remains of saints. But at the same time, I'm doing this comic book, which is participating in the same themes, but is respecting the reality of the different levels. So my comic book is an adventure epic comic book using popular styles, using popular imagery. Um, and so that's what I see. It's like I see it as, and so the t-shirts I'm making, for example, are similar where I'm using semi-icons. They're not totally icons. They're kind of like skirting the, 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 the aesthetic of icons and then putting those out inside into the world, almost like a breadcrumb that you can follow back up like the hierarchy of being. So that's kind of been my strategy, which is to to see what what of the sacred what of the sacred imagery can be integrated into popular culture in a way that's not just like a not just like a horrible uh, how can I say this like a horrible kind of kitschy kitschy thing, but is rather far more integrated into the place where they're supposed to be. That's been my approach. Um, and everybody, go to- it's like a pop inversion of pop art is really what I'm doing. I think. Mm. Like turning pop mm, art back on his head. And the site, I, by the way, is a teespring.com slash shop slash symbolic dash world dash apparel. So yeah, go- you can just go to the symbolic world dot store is, is it'll work. Excellent. So uh, I think this is uh, pretty much it right now. The only final things I got to do is super chats here. The the last ones, the, the ones that are remaining, because I do appreciate all the people who uh, do the super chats, no matter for how much. So uh, na body $2 regard. Oh, okay. I read that one. Hopper. Huff. 1000 Huff, which is not as large as you think, but I still really appreciate it. Uh, what is the future of Christianity? It seems to me that both the modern and medieval world are sort of imitations of Christ. Multiplicity uh, slash unity. And the last one over here, HP Lovecraft 499. Thanks for the debate. Although I'd say it's kind of like a mix of discussion and debate. And I think yeah. it was. I think it was just the right amount of uh, both. I think it was. It was. It was just the right amount. Yeah. Like it didn't get. It didn't get hostile. But it was. There was a little bit. I mean, obviously, we're not in the same place. So it was. I thought it was good. Yeah. I liked it. I, I, I wanted. I wanted to do uh, one promo. I'm. I'm working on my seller's website. But I want to send you this if I can, Jonathan. This is my uh, lino cut of uh, Christ in the Desert. Um, so and, I, I would love to send you one. That would be awesome. And I like it. Yeah. I can see it. It's nice. And I, you know, I really where, like and it. you know where else you can get the lino cuts? If you become a Patreon of uh, patreon.com slash break the rules for $30, you are going to get a beautiful print kind of like this one, but from the TFW and OGF series for $20 yeah. for $20, you are going to get absolutely beautiful magnets that my father created. So, um, uh, I don't know, like, uh, Jonathan, if last time we talked about this, that my father, Alexander, he is an artist as well and he creates these uh, very very beautiful uh, magnets i don't know did you uh did you see those magnets yet no i don't i don't th- i don't think i know what you're talking about so here you could see both the magnets on this uh, screen i'm uh, blowing it up uh the magnets as well as some of his paintings over here and the nutcracker oh, so they're like carved carved wood with a magnet behind it exactly and the uh mm-hmm. and the nutcracker that you see in my background that's also a nutcracker that my father created kind of oh ba- yeah i was wondering about that that's pretty cool actually i really like that thank you it was ba- it was based on the uh you know the traditional uh uh, well, the Russian tradition of uh, the, these uh, knights. So, uh, and also for fifty dollars for all the sticks fans. Listen, this is very important. All the sticks fans that are watching this right now, you can get this exquisite sticks. Uh, not a magnet. This is a wooden. This is a wooden dragon that you can put on. Uh, you know, wherever you want. And sticks got this one delivered to him in Vermont, so he's gonna have it when he comes back to the United States. But uh, you could get a very similar one. So twenty dollars, if you are Styx fans, you can get a smaller wooden magnet of this as well. And if you do not care for Styx but want something similar, you can get a high quality wooden magnet of whatever design you want within limits, of course. You know, don't ask us to do like the Statue of Artemis or something like that. You know, like with all the intricate details. Oh, 
the reason why I say that there was somebody who asked that. So there's going to be a painting of Artemis with the bow and arrow instead on the high quality wood. But anyway, you get the idea. Patreon.com slash break the rules. Become a patron today. What are you waiting for? Listen, as we all know, this cannot grow without your help. So help us grow. Also, odyssey.com. Go to odyssey.com. The link I'm posting over here, subscribe to Odyssey. This is the great exodus right now because we do not trust these algorithms, not one bit. So I want to mm-hmm. thank I want to thank Jonathan Peugeot and Geo and of course Twitter.com slash gi- Giant Geo. Hold on, Geo, I gotta finish oh, the yeah, yeah. I gotta finish the shilling. Twitter.com slash Giant Geo and Twitter.com slash Lev Poe. This is my Twitter, and this is also where you can find the Twitter space that I'm going to launch as soon as this thing ends. So go there. So you can go and actually talk to us. Yes, exactly. After. Exactly. Well, someone said uh, maybe get uh, John David Ebert and Jonathan Beju. That would be a dream come true for me because I highly recommend, Jonathan, go and read Art After Metaphysics. It will maybe tick the needle a little bit on your... Uh, view of the contemporary world but maybe not <laughs> yeah, maybe so guys we're going to transition right now so jonathan thank you so right. much thank you so much nice friend, to meet especially... you everybody all right Take care. thank you bye-bye all right everybody subscribe and we are ending this right now subscribe 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 god bless and goodbye, goodbye.